Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Every truth is not for every person at every time. If a person's heart is not receptive towards the truth, they will repel it. Of course, Jesus understood this, for Mark tells us, With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Even at the end of his ministry, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Obviously, the disciples' heart were not yet ready to receive those things he wanted to share with them. But later, the resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would transform their hearts into fertile soil. I have found that there are two indications which reveal that the soil of a person's heart might be changing into a state of receptivity. Firstly, when they are struggling in an area of life and the truth you want to share has the answer to that problem. And secondly, when they ask a question relating to that truth. These things may indicate that a person's heart has softened in this area. So let's be sensitive towards people's receptivity whenever we seek to share the truth. This is Set Free with Ken Legg. And welcome to Set Free with Ken Legg. I'm Phil Edwards and we've had an interesting week looking at the subject of guarding your heart. Now, you remember in an earlier program this week, Ken asked three questions about the heart. What's in your heart? How did it get there? And what's God's way of dealing with it? We've talked a fair bit about uh, what is in our heart and the kinds of things that help shape our hearts. But Ken, what about God and our hearts? Good question, Phil. Well, first of all, one of the great blessings of the new covenant is that God promises to give us a new heart. Uh, Through Ezekiel the prophet, God said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now, what does that mean? I believe it means that the heart of every Christian is now a sphere of divine influence. God works in our hearts through two agents, uh, his living word, of course, And the Holy Spirit. But secondly, God searches our heart to know what is there. Now that's something that we don't need to be afraid of. I used to be afraid when when I when I heard that God searches our heart. Oh Mm -hmm. no. What's he gonna find? Exactly. (laughs) But uh, the psalmist said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is anything wicked in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now God who knows the hearts of all can reveal what is in our hearts and transform them. And of course, This involves setting us free from those crooked thinking patterns and replacing those with the truth. And the important thing, you know, if we're scared about that notion that God is going to uh, search our hearts, it's not that he's doing it with a big stick. He's doing it with the power to transform us. And he goes to work in our hearts, you know, through the word of God and the spirit of God. Yeah. Let's let's close uh, this week, Phil, looking at an example of that very thing. Jesus transforming the condition of the heart. Now, in Luke chapter 24, we've got that account that I'm sure many of the listeners will be familiar with. The two disciples, remember, on their way on the road to uh, Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And uh, as they were walking along, it seems like they were having a lively discussion. Uh, In fact, that's brought out by one of the Greek words there. You know, Jesus said, what kind of conversation is this that you're having? That word conversation there is actually the word antibalo, from which we get our word (laughs) anti-ballistic. It means, Hmm. you know, They were throwing backwards and forwards words in this sort of heated verbal exchange. And as one of them was voicing his opinion, his words were getting interrupted or shot down, as it were, midair. And then he was sending a barrage of missiles over. So they were really in kind of um, heated exchange here. And Jesus comes alongside them. He says, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Now, they replied that they were sad because of what had taken place over the last few days. Jesus, who they believed to be a prophet, was taken by the chief priests and rulers, condemned to death and delivered up to be crucified. And they were shattered because they believed that he was the Messiah and that uh, they, they just couldn't understand what was going on and, and how this could have taken place. Now, on top of that, reports were circulating that his body was missing from the tomb and some even said they had seen a vision of angels announcing that he was alive. Now, remember, Jesus is right there with them, and so he's Mm. listening to all this, and then he replies with these words. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Yeah, I often wonder what it must have been like a little bit later on when they realized who it was that they were with. Um, They must have felt pretty silly. But are you saying that their hearts were slow to believe, the the disciples? 
Well, that's what Jesus said. Now, remember, we're saying that we live out of what's in our heart, okay? So their hearts were slow to believe. And that was something that was common with all the disciples. See, regardless of the fact that Jesus had told them over and over again that he would be crucified, buried, and then rise from the dead, they chose not to believe it. Mm. And later, Jesus had to rebuke the 11 for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they would not even believe the report of those that had seen him risen from the dead. Now, sadly, Phil, this condition of heart is not limited to the first disciples. Unbelief is a common problem with many Christians today. And and it's far more serious than we realize. In fact, there's only one time in the New Testament that it refers to the state of a believer's heart as being evil. And that is when it has become hardened through unbelief. Now, the writer to the Hebrews warns us, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So the state of the disciples' hearts right then when they were walking towards Emmaus is they had hard hearts, and that's why they were despondent. But obviously Jesus didn't leave them with hardened, uh, unbelieving hearts, did he? No. uh, The next thing that we read is that in order to transform their hearts, uh, the Bible says this, he began at Moses and all the prophets to expound all that was in the Scriptures concerning himself. Mm, what now, a conversation, hey? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that is the best Bible study that has ever been conducted. Yep. They walk for 11 kilometers, walking together with Jesus, and Jesus is opening up the whole of the Old Testament to them and showing them how it's all pointing to himself, you know, his death and his resurrection and all those things. And, uh, you know, no doubt he, he sort of took the types and the shadows. He took many of the prophecies and the promises Uh, many of the messianic predictions written in the prophets and so on. And by the time they got to the end of the journey, the Bible says this, that he broke bread with them and then he disappeared from their midst just as quickly as he'd arrived. But by this time, their eyes were opened. Mm -hmm. And this is what we read, Phil. uh, They said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? So let's just follow this through for a moment, Phil. Their hearts went from being slow to believe or hardened, as we call it, through unbelief to burning with joy and passion. What a transformation. Now, Mm. what is it that brought about that remarkable change? And the answer is that their distorted thinking was replaced with the life-liberating truths based on the biblical perspective of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Now, that sounds to me as a bit of a key. It is. It's the key. I mean, it's the key to the transformation of the heart. In a similar way, I mean, we can bring that right the way down to the times in which we're living right now. A lot of the garbage that's been accumulated in our hearts over many years can be cleaned out and replaced with God's truth and grace. And and once again, the key to that radical heart surgery is to have a revelation of what does the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to me. It means this, Phil, that whoever we are and whatever happened to us in the past, the people we used to be in Adam, those people died and were buried with Christ. We've been raised with to newness of life. You know, we have new resources. We have the power of God's resurrection life in us, and we live out of the abundance, out of the reservoir of God's grace now. So, Ken, just to finish, for someone listening and thinking, I need this that they're talking about, what should they do? Well, if uh, someone is listening at this stage is not a Christian, just believe that what Jesus did on the cross was for them. He died in their place. And, and when a person puts their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside and to transform them from the inside out. Now, for a believer that may be stuck in a place of uh, bondage, if I can use that word, mm-hmm. it all begins with discovering the truth about you now. Who are you now in Christ and what resources do you now have in Him? Well, that brings us to the end of our series this week. Hope you can join us next week when we start a brand new one. Until then, remember, you don't have to carry that baggage. God wants you to be set free. For books, DVDs, small group studies and other resources from Ken Legg, including the book What's Eating You, which features topics from today's message, visit kenlegg.com.au. That's K-E-N-L-E-G-G dot com dot A-U.